Thanks, thanks, um, Paul, and also thanks to uh, PPB for sponsoring the event today. Uh, I thought it was probably wise of me to expand on your introduction a little bit and give you a little bit of a background to myself. Uh, I've grown up on a, a thousand cow dairy farm in South Gippsland, um, which certainly helped gain my ropes in agriculture as a dairy farmer. Um, and I've, I moved into valuation industry in 2007 and have been in the agribusiness space ever since then. So the topic that I'm, I'm going to touch on today or talk about is new money in agriculture. And to get through this I thought it would be wise to what, what is new money in agriculture. I thought about it a few ways and, and thought that new money is money that doesn't exist in a local area or in agriculture already. Um, so it doesn't include farmers that may be expanding their operations or selling out in one area and buying in another. But more so new money that's been raised onshore or offshore and coming into a new area. So I thought I should give you a bit of an insight into agriculture as it stands today and some historic land value trends that we've seen in the past 20 to 30 years. From this I thought we could look into managed investment schemes which were tax driven investment, corporate investment into pure agriculture and mining investment with a higher end use. Foreign investment is also a topical issue at the moment and I thought it, it would be wise to touch on some historic foreign investment and also some current foreign investment. And also that we should probably look at an invest, foreign investment register. Over the past 20 years, we've seen a trend towards economies of scale with larger amalgamated farms and smure, fewer smaller farms. In 1979, there were approximately 115,000 broadacre farms, which is reduced to 58,000 in 2006 and 7, a big decline. The value of these farms, over $500,000, has increased by approximately 32%, and the value of farms under $100,000 has decreased by 58%, whilst farm debt levels over the past six years have increased by 100%. Agriculture is seen as a safe haven for investment, a hedge against inflation, and we've seen recently a significant capital raising from various entities including Tiacref, the River Cattle Fund, Laguna Bay Pastoral, and many others, which has totaled almost $4 billion. And that's to be invested in the US, Brazil, and Australian agriculture. When we look at land in comparison to the rest of the world, in comparison to wheat production, we see that our land is relatively inexpensive at just over $1,000 per tonne of wheat produced. The thing about Australian agriculture is the value still tends to, tends to resemble the productive capacity of that land to produce crops. Now what's happened historically? We've seen a sharp spike in land values in the late 1980s with high interest rates, which then plateaued in the 1990s. And then we've seen a big increase again in the 2000s. In the 2000s, this was driven by low stable interest rates, high confidence levels, MIS activity to a lesser extent, and an increase in corporate and institutional activity, which also lifted confidence levels. So on my first case study, Managed Investment Schemes, or MIS, I'm sure we all know of them pretty well, there's forestry and horticulture. I'm mainly focusing on the forestry side of MIS today. And my case study area was in Glenelg, Moyne and Southern Grampian Shires. I'm not sure if everyone can see this or not. Um, and the graph, before I go on any further, the red line represents the Glenelg Shire 
and the blue, the dark blue is mine and the, and the light blue southern grampians and this yellow line here is 1999, 1998 and over here 2007. So these values are indexed to exclude CPI, so they're real figures. So we saw in 1997 to 2007 a big push by MIS for timber and paper products, which is also driven by large taxation incentives for private investors. This meant during this time that MIS were able to outbid and outcompete farmers for land at a prices above market value. Mean, mean land values from 1999 to 2007 in the Glenelgshire rose by 176%, which when relative to Moyne and Southern Grampian shires, which showed 77 and 95% respectively. So we can see there that the Glenelg land values were very closely aligned to Moyne and Southern Grampians for the period prior to 1998. And then we saw a big distortion in the market where MIS investment was particularly relevant in Glenelg. And now we're seeing with the exit of MIS that land days are more coming closely aligned with the other shires. What MIS did, did allow in some respects is for farmers to exit the market with dignity and respect and for some to move on to other areas and reinvest in agriculture. Concluding MIS it was clear that it created a two-tiered two market between farmers and MIS. However, this appears to have been short-lived and commodity prices are now catching back up and allowing farmers to outcompete MIS. As a second form of new money, look at corporate investment in Moree. Corporate investment being that, that they still rely on agricultural returns for their productivity and hence cannot t do not tend to pay above market values for land because at the end of the day they still have a responsibility to report to shareholders and get agricultural returns. Moree has represented favourable value from a production, water security, access to labour and markets and also value for money when compared to other cropping areas. Recent corporate activity included Macquarie Bank related entities, Lawson Grains more recently, Westchester via Global Ag Fund, Prime Ag and many others. What we found in the Moray area was that the, under, the underlying driver in value was the neighbour to neighbour market, not so much corporates. We found that when neighbour to neighbour transactions decrease there's typically a decline in values and this is what tends to drive land values rather than corporate investment. We've seen growth over the long term. This graph here, the blue lines represent the volume of transactions um, on a yearly basis, and the red line represents the mean land value index to CPI, uh, index to exclude CPI. So those numbers are real again. Um, and what we've seen is a growth of about six and six and a half percent over that period of properties over 100 hectares. But this has not been year on year. As you can see, there's quite volatility, quite a lot of volatile, quite a lot of volatility in the line there, with growth of up to 47% in some years and reductions in 27% in others. When we move this model to 250 hectares to see if there was actually a, an increase in return for larger properties, we found that the return for properties over nine over 250 hectares is actually 9.44%. To further build on this, we thought, well, let's look into corporates and see how they've actually impacted on the transactional activity and found that over the last 27 years, they've only actually bought 4.5% of the total land transactions or 11.8% total dollar value, which is 156 million from 1.35 billion in transactions. In the last 10 years, when corporate investments become more prevalent, we've seen these stats move to 10.2% of land and 16% of dollar value. So while 